Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you, Richard, uh, for that introduction. It's nice to be regarded as credible, even if only in the name of the Goose Man. Graham Pollard, what to say about this distinguished bibliographer? I suppose, first, one should look at his contributions to classical bibliography, where the remarkable thing was his range from the early printed books right through to newspapers. But in a way more remarkable and more significant in some ways was his venturing into other fields. For example, his treatment of the book trade, or as we've seen quite recently, his important contributions to the study of bookbinding. And all of this material integrated. So, in a way, it's a, a, a privilege, but it's also a bit daunting. I mean, there he is looking down very intelligently on the proceedings now. And I'm reminded of the time that I gave a talk in the Clooney Museum, and I was looked down on by the stony faces of the kings of Judah. So the question that I had in my mind was, how am I going to connect to Graham Pollard and his great mass of work? And I found this description of him from a description by John Johnson. A subject hitherto neglected or unobserved. Now, I can do that. That's what I'm going to do today, neglected or unobserved. As advertised, I'm going to look at legal deposit material in the British Library, and the dates you'll recognize as those of important copyright acts. I'll also be talking about board games in the library that are not catalogued as such, and therefore they're hard to find. And finally, just as a, a bambouche, so to speak, some new work on board games that are hiding in named collections. But before I get to that, let me give a very brief introduction to the sort of material that I normally work with printed board games, and their rules. You'll see that I put a little emphasis on the word printed. This is to try and differentiate what I do from the study of respectable games, like uh, chess or backgammon or drafts. I'm interested in games that have printing as an important part through their iconography, and I'm also interested in their rules, which are as important, if not more important than the games themselves. So we begin, if you like, at the beginning. Here is the game of the goose, about 1600, in its native Italy. And what am I doing showing you a game with no rules, having said how important the rules are? Well, for the good reason that at, at this date, about 1600, the game of the goose had been recorded for at least 150 years. So everybody knew the rules, and you didn't need them. But if you did need them, you wouldn't do them in woodcut, which is tricky. You'd do them in engraving or etching. And here is a very nice example, 1598, and it's been signed on the plate. And I wish everybody had signed everything on the plate, but they don't. And 1598 is the date. Now, even if you didn't know anything about games and you didn't have the rules, you'd probably recognize that this was a spiral race game played with dice and you're racing to try and get to the winning space, number 63. And you'll see there the two gentlemen with uh, some wine or some beer uh, ready to celebrate. On the way, if you land on a goose, which is regarded as lucky, you get your points again, and there are various hazards, such as the death space, where you have to start again. Now, it was through the medium of printing, at about this time, that the game diffused throughout Europe. And it came to England, as we know. We have the Stationers Hall record. And John Wolfe, who entered the uh, new and most pleasant game of goose uh, for the purpose, needs no introduction. He was, of course, 
the printer for the City of London. But what you may not know is that he did his journeyman training in Florence, and it seems a good uh, guess that he brought the game of goose with him from Florence. Unfortunately, we don't have his copy, and 17th century uh, games of goose in England are hard to find. But here is one. Uh, the term catalogue dates this as 1690, but it could well be a bit earlier. This is the Morgan Library uh, copy. And you'll see that the same iconography of uh, the two gentlemen with their glasses um, is, is preserved. Now, that's moderately interesting, but the key development occurs not in England, but in France, uh, in the middle of the 17th century, where we start to get variations for the educational purposes. And this is probably the first. This is the game of the world by a well-known uh, map maker, Pierre Duval, uh, geographer to the king. And what he has done is to put 63 countries and states of the world in a spiral, like the goose game, in order to arrive at the winning space, which, as you will see in the middle, is France, because France is the best country in the world. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in the corners, Duval gives explanation as to how the figure works, as I mentioned. He tells you how the game is played with uh, two dice, just as the goose game. He gives a brief statement of the laws in the left-hand corner, bottom. But in the right lower corner, intriguingly, he says that there's more to be had. If anybody asks him, he will send... Um, a copy of more information. And so we probably have the first rule sheet. And it is indeed rarer than the game itself, which is rare enough. And I only know of the one copy in the BNF. Uh, and it tells us about uh, the game of the world. And some of the things are interesting, some are less so. For example, who arrives at China, space 36, will get his points again because the Chinese don't allow entry into their realm. So in other words, he's using the same sort of rule as if you landed on a goose. Now, there are many uh, different variations that occur in France at this time. And what is astonishing is that these were not picked up in England and copied or, or altered and adapted. And it took about a century before English games uh, started to um, come up with new ideas. And when they did, it was on the basis of the, the Grand Tour. And here we have the game of geography, the Grand Tour, uh, designed by Dr. Nugent, who had written a book about the Grand Tour. <clears throat> and you'll see here the rules are actually on the sheet. Now, these games started to proliferate in England in various forms for educational purposes, and they were treated very seriously along the lines that Locke had proposed. And, sorry, I must, before I, I, I do that, I must t tell you a little bit about this journey. Um, first of all, I thought you'd like to visit Baal, because there is the Erasmus Library. You'd better not visit Ferrara, once a flourishing city, but on the decline since it became subject to the Pope. And this is just a warning that these games are not quite as passive as they might appear. Here we have the development of the uh, educational games in historical pastime, um, uh, going from uh, the uh, Battle of Hastings to uh, George III, and you'll see that there is really quite a respectable little rule book. And the rule book uh, shows uh, the rules of the game on the left. And on the right, there are several pages uh, like this, which give details of uh, the particular spaces. And the idea is that you read them out. And therefore, you produce a very boring game, which will deaden anybody's Sunday afternoon very effectively. But by the time we get to our period for today, 
the rules of late Victorian and Edwardian games, things were a bit less formal. Like that, for example. And that uh, is from one of the legal deposit volumes in the British Library. Parlour football, the game of House of Commons, Ringtail, and Boscobel. And a pretty scrubby lot they are, and that's what we're dealing with today. <clears throat> How did they get here? Let me talk a little about the legal deposit and copyright. There I've tabulated the various copyright acts, beginning with the Statute of Anne. And I'm just highlighting the important points that the statute listed the Royal Library and various others, which were to be supplied with copies of all books printed by the printers to be delivered to the Company of Stationers. The 1801 Act added a couple of things, but the 1814 Act now placed the responsibility on the libraries to demand copies. And then we have the first mention of the Library of the British Museum, which of course in due course became the British Library. And now we come <clears throat> to the 1842 Act, which for the first time defines the word book. Every volume, part or division, every pamphlet, sheet of letterpress and so on. In other words, everything with typescript, uh, sorry, anything with letterpress on it. Um, otherwise, uh, the uh, control of th things that are not covered by this, uh, engravings, uh, come under the Holbein Act and its uh, successive acts. So we now have book as defined. And those of you who feel that the Bibliographic Society is coming a bit down market by talking about games, every time I say the word game, just think of book and you'll be, you'll be okay. <clears throat> and the second important thing, one copy is to be sent to the British Museum Library by the publisher, not on demand as before. And so between 1842 and 1911, we have a very stable regime. A book is to be provided by the publisher to the British Museum. Those other four libraries may demand a book. And then that settles the precedence of publication. But the right of exploiting that, the legal right, is dependent on copyright registration at Stationers Hall, where there is a fee. Now, you will realize that statute is one thing and enforcement is another, which is where Sir Anthony Panizzi comes in. I've summarized his career, but the only interesting point for us is that he began prosecutions in 1850 under the 1840 Act, 1842 Act. And this was unprecedented because the previous uh, provisions of legal deposit were widely ev evaded, ignored, and of no effect. So he began public uh, prosecutions in the magistrate's court. And to say this was not appreciated by the publishers is a masterpiece of understatement. And nobody was less appreciative than Henry George Bone, the most troublesome opponent against Panizzi. Harsh, vexatious, tyrannical, he said of Panizzi, who, I mean, Panizzi didn't want, much want to do this. He was forced into it by the Board of Trustees of the British Museum. Bowen's point, of course, was that he got prosecuted if he didn't send a book. And he would have been perfectly prepared to send a book if asked, but that's not what the Act said. And Panizzi won his cases. Bowen said, no English gentleman would do this, which coming from Bowen was a bit rich, you may feel. The trouble was, that all this stuff, all the rules and little broadsheets and whatever, came into the British Library, British Museum Library, where they were a nuisance. And this is why. They had to be catalogued. And this is a rather indifferent picture of the general catalogue in the late Victorian era. Those are uh, letterpress slips that have been prepared from 
handwritten manuscript slips which have had to be prepared by somebody who knew their business, have had to be checked by somebody who knew even more of their business. The things that came back from the printer had to be checked again. Why should you bother with all these dreadful little rules? Well, what I find is really endearing is that a shortcut was taken. And there it is, which is where my title comes, Games Not Catalogued. Isn't it nice? And there they've been stuck into a, a, a guard volume, a fair-sized guard volume, admittedly. And it's a bit hard to say games not catalogued because this uh, uh, particular volume is equipped with a manuscript index. And there it is, a collection of instructions and rules for games with manuscript index, and there they all are. And I rather like the inscription. The old copyright office obviously had it about its person. Now, there are two more volumes like this going on from 1930, and if this had been the, the system, and if it had been carried through uniformly, life would be easy. But it was not. And quite a number of things appeared in this volume. This is a very large guard volume. Um, I suppose it must be about three feet by two feet. It's almost too heavy to handle. And it has at least 100 uh, items on games within it. If it was just that, it would not be too bad. But there are other equally large volumes with titles like this. Miscellaneous, miscellaneous collections, and indeed my favorite, useful arts. Because what, one thing that these games are not is useful arts, I can tell you. So there they are. The, this is the first set of uh, items that I showed you. And let me just indicate some of the problems. In this very large garden volume, I've listed here, and you don't, need, you don't need to read them all, the games are starting with A, and I got about a third of the way through. And on the right-hand column is what you will find if you search the electronic catalogue for game. Now, the difference is that some of the items on the left have had the word game put into them, or have it in originally, so that at the bottom you see Holloway or Votes for Women, you will pick up because it says the cataloger in square brackets, a game, rule. But Climbing Monkeys, of which much more later, you will not find. So let's have some numbers. These are the only numbers, so I immediately apologize for them. They're indicative numbers. I mean, what do I call a game? What do I call not a game? And so on. Don't worry about it. But we're talking about an influx of several hundred games per decade. And you'll see that some have been destroyed in the war, that's the yellow. <clears throat> some are uh, not catalogued um, in, one of the, in the large volume, some are not catalogued in the first volume that I showed you. So if you just rely on games in the catalog, you will miss a lot. And I undoubtedly am missing a lot still. So what can we do with all this material? Well, I'm, we can do a lot, but I'm going to concentrate on a totally neglected area, and that is penny games. And I'm going to do some recognizable book history, looking at a particular uh, publisher. I'm going to find some unrecorded games, and I'm going to find a publisher which was hitherto not known. So we begin with the work of James March. Now, those of you who know about uh, children's publication and chapbooks will know James March. Really high quality wood engraver, publisher of chapbooks. And there you see that there are really quite nice pictures in the 40 Thieves. But what's not known, or at least I didn't know it, and it's not in any of the records, was that he also produced broadsheets uh, which were sold for a penny, games like this comic fox hunt, where you cut out the little horses uh, and use them as tokens to go round according to the uh, throw of a teetotum, a spinner. And uh, there are various uh, hazards which are indicated by arrows, and the whole thing is really nicely done. A good quality uh, depiction of a fox in its forest. 
not a very interesting game, but this is. And this calls itself uh, the royal game of goose. Well, I can tell you it's nothing like the games of goose that we've been looking at. It is, in fact, a sort of draw lottery. And what you do is you cut out the little numbers at the top, put them in a hat or something, and you draw them out. And according to what number you draw, you pay to the pool or take from it. So, for example, um, if we look at number one, that's Queen Victoria. To support her throne, claims five pieces as her own. So you put five in the pool, and if you picked up uh, number 25, uh, which is the, uh, the winning space, uh, you would take the entire pool. Just to look at the iconography, in the middle we have a picture of uh, Mother Goose sitting on her gander. And this is a well-known picture, well-known um, depiction from Thomas Dibden's pantomime of 1806, first produced in Covent Garden, which is the first time that Mother Goose flew across the stage on a wire. And Mr. Samuel Simmons uh, was the unfortunate rider. Now, I'm going to come back to that picture a bit later. So the second topic in Penny Games was to show some which are not previously recorded. This is a series called the Aerial Series, um, the Good Brothers at Clerkenwell Road, London. And you'll see that they are uh, quite, quite jolly, chromolithographic uh, productions, um, attractive. Are they of interest? No, not really. <laughs> Most of them are not. But I thought you'd like this one, because it's got a volvel. And many of you are more familiar with, with volvels uh, in other contexts. Uh, this is a children's game. Each child has a particular color. The windmill's sails advance according to throw of, uh, of a die. And if the uh, sails match up with your color, then you can put a counter on the board and so on until all your, your slots have been filled. Quite ingenious and quite nice, but not very significant. <clears throat> Third topic. Another series, the Royal Series. And this is completely devoid of any publishing information. And this has caused quite a difficulty to catalogue us uh, up and down the land. And you'll see that it includes the new and exciting game of climbing monkeys, complete for one penny. And this is what you get, um, a splendid new game. The uh, monkeys race uh, up different uh, palm trees according to the uh, turning of that spinner that it's, you cut out and put a, stick th a matchstick through. And if the monkey lands on a branch, then it has to wait and so on. So it's a, a dull enough game for anybody. But it has the great advantage of being able to be linked to a publisher. And here I want to introduce uh, the games board. Now the games board is a rather grand uh, title for a group of curators, collectors, uh, games historians, mostly concerned with English games, but there are also um, members uh, from outside England. We have uh, a couple of persons here who know all about the games board. James Masted, who is the uh, webmaster, Edward Copisaro, who's done much of the work, uh, and Tessa beside him, who's done a lot too. The whole point of the Games Board is that it maintains a, a research database called GARD, the Games Research Database, and in that there's a lot of detail about games. But for our purposes, the interesting thing is that uh, members of the Games Board have been to the National Archive and have transcribed many of the copyright registrations. No easy task, because the original copyright registrations for these games are not well indexed at all. And so, here we are, the entry for the new and exciting game of Climbing Monkeys, complete one penny, and we see that it's by Charles H. 
Henry Johnson uh, up in Leeds in the county of York. So we have um, an example of the utility of this study of these rather neglected penny games. If I'm honest with you, I'm not very interested in this. <laughs> My interest is not so much in um, finding this kind of book history detail. I'm more interested in the cultural history of games. As I express it, games as a mirror of their time. And I want to spend a bit of uh, this lecture talking about one aspect before I, I, I move on, and that is war and empire. It's, it's an area that's had a fair amount of academic attention. And many people have simply said, because there are games that treat of war and empire in this period, it reinforces their ideas about uh, the attitude of uh, the, the, the country uh, towards the empire. And my aim today is to show it's a bit more complicated than that. Here's a nice example. This is in the British Library. It's categorized as a map, but that's another story. John Betts, a tour through the British colonies and foreign possessions. And you'll see immediately uh, in the header all the trappings of empire and naval power. We have a lion, we have Britannia probably, we have Neptune, we have cannons, uh, the whole works. So if you looked at it casually, you'd say it was simply reinforcing ideas of empire and British dominance. But look, you have to look in the rule book, which is not actually in the British Library at all. Number 15 at the bottom, Sarawak, governed by Sir James Brooke with the assumed title of Raja. Notoriety by the massacre of natives, condemning them without any sufficient proof as pirates. How does this come about? Well, Betts is a Quaker, and his attitude towards uh, war and force is by no means typical of empire and, col and colonialism. And in, in this rule book, he operates very judicially. And some, uh, some actions of the British Empire are commended, such as education, such as the liberation of slaves, and others are condemned in forceful terms. And this is not an isolated example. I could give several others where the rule book provides a pretty sharp commentary, um, which is rather at variance from the game sheet itself. There's, there's one map game, Crystal Palace game, uh, which really does look as if it celebrates empire. Uh, the rule book is lost, but a review of the rule book and the game is in the Athenaeum Journal. And the, the comment fr taken from the rule book is the British Empire where the sun never sets, but the tax gatherer never sleeps. And this so inflamed the reviewer in the Athenaeum Journal that he suggested that the rule book be thrown in the fire. So the games are not quite as innocuous as they appear. Contrast this. Trafalgar, same sort of trappings, guns, bangs, whatever. Um, we have a picture of the board in the rule book. One of the members of the games board has the, uh, the ships which go on the board. If you look in the rule book on the left, it says, universal interest in matters containing our navy, Trafalgar should appeal, uh, sailor-loving youngsters equally captivated. It's pretty neutral. And the real point of the game is the unusual method of capture shown in the diagrams where if you put the enemy ship between two of yours, then you sink it. Of course, you could say that this kind of low-key acceptance of uh, naval power is equally um, interesting. How about this? No doubt about this one. With our bobs to Pretoria, 
Now, our Bobs is the toe-curling name for Lord Roberts in the Boer War, successful campaign to, uh, uh, to um, Pretoria. On the left, we find, uh, we have put to flight Paul Kruger, we save the gold mines, we transport Boers to St. Helena, and so on. Pretoria wins the game, but at the end, at the distribution of the pool, we have to sing God Save the Queen. Not much ambiguity about this game. Another Boer War game, I think my favorite, Chasing de Vet. It's played on a very unusual board, uh, shown up there, a sort of truncated jeweler's diagram, a di diamond. You can play some simple games, race games, chase games, the Derby Harriers and so on. But the important game is chasing uh, uh, Christian de Vette, who was one of the mo most successful ge uh, generals on the other side in the Boer War. And uh, the board actually uh, represents, I don't know if you can see the little circles at the top, they represent fortified copies, which de Vette can use to evade capture, but the pursuers can't. And indeed, the pursuit of de Vette was a sort of vicarious game that was played in the national media. And I particularly like this, this quote. This is not from the game. De Vett, the English skedaddle, an A1 retreat. And the commander swore they've got through the net that's been spread with such care for Christian de Vett. So this, I think, re reduces the pursuit of war to something amusing, which you may find inappropriate as well. I haven't time to go through my other topics with uh, so many examples, although the examples could be multiplied. Here's my second topic, the political unrest in uh, the period, towards the end of the period, the suffragette movement. And here we have uh, the, the board game. Um, the only copy I think is in the, in the Bodleian, although the rules are in the BL. And before you say it's inappropriate to reduce such an important aspect uh, to a game, look at the imprint. It is, in fact, the Women's Social and Political Union publishing this game in order to produce funds. And the idea of the game is really quite straightforward. It's the police versus the suffragettes. The suffragettes are having a meeting in the Albert Hall. Their aim is to occupy the House of Commons on the other side, and the police aim to turf them out of the Albert Hall. Another aspect of these board games was to reduce boredom because we are now in a period of increasing leisure and much effort was spent on finding board games uh, that would mimic outdoor pursuits that you couldn't do uh, when the light fade, faded or in the winter and they weren't always very successful. Here's an effort to uh, emulate hockey by a very successful games manufacturer and inventor, Waterman of Bristol. But just look at the rules. He's trying to emulate the idea of moving with the ball and then shooting. But the rule, if you read it, the player was a man from 8K, K to E, the ball, and there it moved, was on square, and so on. You really need a law degree in order to understand the rules. So this is a very rare game. And then my final, if you like, misleading example is the way to heaven. It's misleading because if you simply did a statistical count of how many games are concerned with the spiritual side, you would find almost none. And at this time, the spiritual side theology was extremely important. In fact, I think it's said of the, of the British uh, Museum inquiry desk, half the inquiries at about 1900 were to do with theology. But almost not, nothing of this is shown in the, in the game. So how does this example manage to get in? Well, the answer is that it's a Roman Catholic version. And if you look at the rules, you'll see uh, various signs of this. 
uh, um, you'll see devotion to St. Francis and so on. And I can't resist showing you that this has a very impressive pedigree, or at least the generic thought of games taking you to heaven, uh, by showing you a game from my collection, um, a game of point to point. This is a rare imprint of Dijon, 1670. It's a large format game, extremely impressive. And you'll see that the winning spaces uh, at the top, which I've enlarged, um, go uh, to eternity and then to paradise. But unfortunately, if you overthrow, you get to hell and there is no escape. So you lose the game at that point. Now, this game was invented by Father Jean Pierron, who was a Jesuit, who was sent to Canada to convert the Iroquois. And apparently he was highly successful in doing so. And they really loved the game. He was unfortunately murdered by a different tribe somewhat later, so it's not a really happy ending. But it shows the, um, it shows the, the way in which this, this type of game has uh, started, and there are intermediate examples coming through um, on the French side. <clears throat> I just pause at that point to say games as a mirror of society, as a mirror of the culture, it's a pretty distorting or unreliable mirror unless you're very careful with these sources. These are primary sources and they need care just as any ordinary primary sources do. They are uh, unrecognized, uh, underused in the historical context. Finally, I want to talk about a different topic, games hiding in named collections. And my first example is from the Dexter collection. Now, the Dexter collection is about the works of Charles Dickens. So what's it doing with this? And this is, in fact, um, a game of Mother Goose, which uh, de is dependent on the pantomime that I mentioned before. And the reason it's in the Dexter collection is that the Dexter collection includes the memoirs of Joseph Grimaldi. Grimaldi was the star of the show, the, the, the clown in this pantomime. And it's been extra illustrated, the memoirs, volume one, by all sorts of stuff, including this game of Mother Goose by MacDonald, which is extremely uh, rare and unusual. And you'll see it's much later than the pantomime of 1806. It's actually got a postcode EC. So there we have the game as reprinted, and there we have the original, sorry, 1808 of the game, 1806, the pantomime. That from my uh, collection. <clears throat> and we then turn to a new development. That game previously has, has been exhibited, is well known, but the Creed collection has been very little studied. Now, the Creed collection is um, described in the catalogue in, in a very quiet manner. Signs of taverns in, English and Wales, in England and Wales, a collection formed by Mr. Creed. Well, first of all, who was Mr. Creed? And here I pay tribute to Lawrence Worms, whose knowledge of um, uh, London printers and publishers and booksellers is unrivaled, and he is my go-to person, particularly if I want to know about bankruptcy. Here's Giles Creed, gives his addresses, out of business, then he moves, Great Russell Street, and then he's out of business again, and then he goes to Museum Street, Bloomsbury, out of business again. He's a very unsuccessful print seller. He clearly spends much more on his collection and much more time on that than he does in selling prints. During the whole of the above period, clerk and messenger to the Corporation of the Sons of the Clergy, which is sounds very grand. But nonetheless, he's bankrupt. And he dies um, in the following year. And his, co his collection is auctioned. 
Southgate and Barrett speak of his unique collection formed with unwearied diligence and vast outlay during a lifetime, um, 2,500 ancient and modern engravings, which is a bit warmer than the British Library's description, but it gets better. This is the content. Notices on signs and their origins, merriments and witticisms, remarkable incidents, singular inscriptions on taproom windows, anecdotes, an alien and other songs and ballads, some set to music. So really quite a collection. And the thing that interests me is the thing that Felicity Myron found. And Felicity, of course, is supported uh, by the society, and she has the unending job of improving the cataloging of prints in the British Library. So she was looking in the Creed collection for interesting things, and this is what she found. And it's a Dutch goose game. And you'll see how close it is to the early examples uh, which I showed. The interesting thing about this particular goose game is the imprint by Van Zweeman, uh, Zwanen, sorry, Van Zweeman of Rotterdam, and I've consulted the experts in Holland who say that although this imprint is known for uh, um, almanacs and uh, educational, small educational volumes, it is not known for goose games, nor indeed for any popular prints, no sense printing. So it is an extremely unusual uh, print. The iconography is also unusual. Um, at the bottom right, the decoration uh, of, the, uh, of the end space shows Fortune in her cockle shell being driven across the seas in a random fashion by the wind in her sail. And in the center, the hand is taking all the money because you won at 63 again, and it says, all mine. The, the two cherubs at the top have palm branches, and it says, peace time. So it is a very unusual uh, find, and I was extremely pleased to, to see it, but also there is another goose game in the Creed collection, and this is a manuscript game. And what I think it is, in fact, is a, a manuscript translation for an English uh, audience of the goose game the Dutch goose game on the left. Now, why do I say that? Well, if we actually look at the rules, uh, you, you will uh, find halfway down a description of what happens if you come to the labyrinth and you go back three spaces. Now, that is, in fact, a significant and characteristic rule of a Dutch game. The English game would be to go back to space 29, which is different. So it's another example of the importance of looking at rules if you want to be able uh, to understand uh, the uh, descent of, of these games. That's probably not enough to say one is a copy from the other, but if you look at the space number six, the toll bridge hazard, you'll see it's very similar with two figures on the toll bridge, not unusual, but it is unusual for one of them to be putting out a hand in that gesture, and the gesture is repeated. And all the geese have the same attitudes. So I think this is really a, a very nice uh, arrangement um, to find in the Creed collection. And just what else is there? You know, it really, really defies imagination. Now, I've taken a fairly abstract and analytical uh, uh, view of these games. Um, I don't play them. I don't particularly want to play them. I don't particularly regard what I do as um, fun in the normal sense. But there are things that you find which do raise a smile. And uh, as I raise my hat and uh, take leave of you, let me just show you Jiggle Joggle.
Thank you very much, Adrian. That was fascinating, from my point of view, fascinating, unexpected, and visually very, very compelling. Um, just, I'm sure there will be questions both online and here in the room. Just one question that's sort of unrelated to the actual board. What did people tend to use as tokens or counters? Was there any kind of coins? Were there special tokens? It's a big subject, um, and the answer is dependent on where and when. The, the first evidence we have is on French uh, provincial uh, goose games, the Jeux de Loire, where it says everybody should have a distinctive piece of money so that they know which is their own token. So that is how it starts. Um, if we look at the English side, I imagine that was what was done, although it doesn't say so. And it's not until the, uh, the end of the 18th century that we get the development of educational games and the publishers begin to realize that it, they can not only sell the game sheet, but they can also sell a little box, um, such as the one you saw for Trafalgar, which is nicely painted usually on top or maybe just has the name of the game. And inside, it has equipment for play. And originally, um, th those are very simple turned bone or ivory uh, pillars, they're sometimes called, sometimes pyramids. And then they become uh, rather more uh, distinctive, such as the Trafalgar game in which we showed uh, little ships. And of course, um, that was distinctive for the game, and then you get a proliferation of kinds uh, of tokens. But the question is well put. And, and, and they have also survived in sufficient numbers to be well understood. Uh, hmm. um, I did write a paper which was called The Quest for the Pyramids because the pyramids were mentioned in various rules, but nobody was very sure what a pyramid was. We had one surviving box which contained little tetrahedra, a square tetrahedra, whatever. They were little pyramids. And everybody thought, well, this is very interesting until we realized that particular game didn't talk about pyramids, and those pyramids had been added by an enterprising dealer in order to complete the set. Because these uh, boxes with playing equipment are so very, very rarely uh, complete and with original equipment, then great care is needed in, in answering this question. I don't want to abuse my position uh, here, and I know there will be questions in the room. But one final question for me. When the rule books were taken, say, by the British Museum by, for legal deposit, how often would a separate engraved uh, game board go with it? And if so, what do they do with them? Are they also bound up in those volumes? No, they're not. The, the boards in general did not go with the, uh, with the rule books. The rule books were sent in satisfaction of the letter of the law. Um, in some cases, uh, the, uh, the copyright deposition uh, did include uh, the, the printed uh, game sheet, usually not on a board, but simply as a sheet uh, of paper. And some of those uh, remain and are now in the National Archive, where they moved from the, sta uh, the Station of Hall. But in general, um, they're not. And so we have a very frustrating situation of a game like Bosco Bell, where we have a description of the, rule, uh, of the, of the um, playing board, but we do not actually know how it was played, and you can't work it out. Um, other, other questions in the room? Thank you for your, your lecture, which I found absorbing. As bibliographers, we're trained to think about the concept of the ideal copy of a particular book. Um, 
it seems from what you've said that this is a virtual impossibility in the world of gain. Is there any way of establishing uh, with any degree of stability and continuity how particular gains did circulate in their original form? That's actually several questions in one, uh, because a, a, a game usually consists of um, a, a printed sheet, and it may consist of a rule book, it may consist of a box with equipment, and establishing the, uh, the purity of that is really quite difficult. It's easier in the early uh, days when there was simply the printed sheet. And there, the techniques of uh, applying um, bibliographic study are just the same as you would in, t in terms of any um, engraving, any, any print. So that you're, that you're looking for evidence of, uh, of date, you're looking for evidence of de dedications, you're looking for iconographic evidence. Um, you know, very often, the subject matter of the game is uh, sufficiently detailed that you can find uh, some dates, uh, some termini, uh, for example, on map games, frontiers may change, and so forth. So the techniques are undoubtedly there. They have not been applied with as much rigor as I would like. Um, I have a, a, a friend in America who collects um, maps of uh, England and Wales and that includes uh, map games. And for example, he has done a, a proper bibliographic study of uh, the, um, I suppose, t 10 or 12 uh, different states of a particular England and Wales game. Um, and it's, it's that kind of detailed study that you really need to do in order to answer a question that you're putting. on uh, my question just now in, in that answer. Um, I noticed that several of your examples on your slides said second edition or new and revised edition. So did any one edition um, go through numerous reprints or is there an average? I mean, you mentioned just now, you know, Sorry, issues. I'm not getting your... I, I had a hard time hearing your question. Oh, okay. About, uh, it was about, oh, sorry. Yes, it's about edition. So I noticed in the slides, that some of them said second edition, new and revised edition. So did any one edition go through numerous reprints? So you just touched on it a moment ago about the different issues of some of the sheets. Could you say something about that? Yeah. <clears throat> Several games go through multiple editions. Um, there are um, particularly the, the games which uh, relate to historical events um, when a <clears throat> A monarch dies, uh, another monarch is very frequently added, um, and so forth. Um, there are uh, also situations where the, um, the, the publisher uh, changes address, and that is, that is noted on it, so that you have um, all the, all the uh, apparatus of different uh, editions uh, and different issues, different states, and so forth. And there are some cases where the uh, the uh, print, uh, pr uh, a proof is taken, and that is sold as well. So you get a, a, um, something before the lettering uh, occurs. It, it's really just as complicated as anything else, only less well documented. And, and could it also be a bit of salesmanship to sort of indicate that they were flying off the shelf? I think that is that is probably <laughs> probably true. Um, uh, certainly, the the uh, the case of uh, uh, French fashions, um, they decided to update that fairly frequently, so as not to be uh, um, uh, accused of set setting something too old hat. <clears throat> Other. Edward. <clears throat> Thank you, Adrian. I felt, thought that was a, a great talk. I had two questions for you. One was, have you established a reason why rules contributed 
continue to be contributed to the British Library after 1911, when it was no longer an obligation to do so. And the other thing is, for the large number of games that seem to be entered at Stationers Hall and for which there is a deposit at a copyright library, and where none of the games board managed to find the entry at Stationers Hall in the, at, on visiting the National Archives, um, have, have you formed a view as to whether people were claiming entry at Stationers Hall and depositing but not actually entering in order to avoid the fee? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a it's a difficult uh, it's a difficult question to answer in relation to the uh, to the archives. Um, I don't know. I ha I haven't gone back um, and done a search for games that are, uh, are produced um, from my search here to see whether the uh, copyright record um, actually exists. Unless it's actually in the games board, I haven't done that. Um, your first question is, why did games rules continue to be deposited after uh, 1911 in Stationers Hall when it wasn't necessary for copyright purposes? The answer to that is I don't know, but uh, you'll find also that there are games rules deposited in other copyright libraries um, such as the, the Cambridge University Library and indeed in, in, in the Bodleian um, when I'm sure they weren't requested, but they were um, deposited according to the Act. And if you look at the Cambridge University Library system, they stamp, uh, the date stamp has a letter A, meaning it's come in under the Act. Uh, so um, I don't know. I think it's just inertia or um, perhaps be, being belt and braces. We've always sent it along and it's safer to do so. It doesn't cost much. Nobody wants these anyway, and we've got a few extra. <laughs> I don't know. It's as simple as that, maybe. <clears throat> I know we have one question online. Let me ask one of the online questions. Um, it's from Tony Boydell of the Museum of Board Games in the Forest of Dean. As someone new to this world of older board games, how significant is the crossover with your work and the legacy work of FRB Whitehouse and others? White House was a great pioneer. Uh, in, uh, he um, was the chairman of uh, Chad Valley. He had a, a collection of important board games, and he wrote a book on um, Georgian and Victorian games, uh, which had uh, no rival for a good number of years. Um, it, it, it set out as being a complete uh, list with the intention of being a complete list of board games of, of this period, and it may well have uh, succeeded to the extent of about 60%. So there are many more games than are in, in White House. Um, the index is absolutely execrable, and the degree of scholarship is more or less confined to seeing what you can pick up from the surface of the game uh, rather than any deep analysis. But it, it should be celebrated because it was new and it was important. It was also published in Royston. <laughs> Question from Robert Laurie. Is there nothing in the trade press for news agents or toy shops which would have advertised or reviewed the games for retailers? Uh, yes, there, there, there are uh, indeed um, reviews in the, in, in the, in the, in the popular prints. Um, and uh, those, in some cases, help uh, to date. Um, I don't know, but they're, they're not a particularly uh, fruitful um, source of information but they do exist and they should be noted. <laughs>